<laughs> oh, we missed a lot of the good stuff. <laughs> well, they also don't drink officially, but um, the college students, there's, there's two countries where college students around the world are notorious for coming to college and totally drinking themselves, <laughs> binge drinking. So which countries do you think those are? The US, especially the South. Ireland. And no, Saudi Arabia, Boo. right? The US and Saudi, it's places where dry counties, you know, it's places where they've been denied, right? Does that make sense? They come to college and, okay. Um, all right, so Ryan, did you have a, something you wanted to say? Um, one of the things that I found interesting, well, actually relates to this whole idea um, is the quote was, enjoy, use, and benefit from, preserve, protect, and promote fellow creatures. And I think that's interesting because again, I just like the topic of like the, what we talked about a few weeks ago is like, does religion conflict with science or environmental justice? And I think it's just so ridiculous. So I'm not going to let this up. Like, I'm just going to keep compiling like, like quotes that just defeats the whole idea because I think it's just so ignorant. Like, Very good. Oh, bravo. Let's applaud for Ryan. It is so ignorant. <laughs> to split reason and religion and science on environmental issues, right? This is God's creation, right? I don't know. <laughs> and then what is the cause? Well, the cause is greed, right? And every one of these books is always condemning greed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Very good. Well, now you have your soapbox and you can, or another soapbox whatever <laughs> okay um zane uh yeah one thing that i just kind of found interesting is like whenever it came to like talking about like the differences in islam like when it comes to like the terrorists and then like you know like the moderate like the moderate ones in the u.s and how i think it like because obviously the moderate ones in the u.s said like the 9-11 attacks, they can't accept that into their religion or whatever. They can't accept that as a part of Islam or whatever. And I kind of found that, like, interesting because, I mean, obviously, it, I mean, there's a lot of stereotypes that go around. Like, I can see, like, especially around here that people don't know a lot about Islam. Like, where, like if they saw somebody, you know, wearing what, I don't know what they call it, that, the you know, the women had to wear around their heads. He they like, you know, yeah, yeah, right. They, they get, like, you know, like, superstitious or whatever. I don't know what to say, but they get scared. But obviously like that's not what the you know majority of islam in a way that's not what they practice and it's actually peaceful so that's kind of what uh I, I got out of it good very good um jordan can you say anything or are you too sick or too tired or um well anyway jordan go ahead raise your hand whenever you want to speak or else put something in the chat. Um, Tim. Hello? Go yeah. ahead, Tim. Okay, so. It's um, still pretty, it's still very um, muted. I mean, not entirely muted, but really, really soft. Um, there, there. Okay, so I was going to talk about, <laughs> wait, it's not working again? It just <laughs> comes in and out like this. Um, well, I'll just start talking and we'll just see if you can do that. Okay, talk loud. Okay, so, because I was going to talk about there's not a virtue of five. It was a general city set up program for economic development where it said, do not reward terrorist attacks by giving potential terrorists more social advantages than others. So what I got out of that is like, well, uh, we never know who's a terrorist and all the technology we have in the U.S. A lot of people take it for granted. 
So it, it can be um, to a lot of people good, but also we are grown and we keep using our technology too much and other people get their hands on it. Oh, Tim, I think you better type it up. I don't think, unless you can figure out how to punch a button or, you know, punch something in or something out or something, it's not working very well. Um, so what did Jordan say? Let's see. Um, okay, she can't talk and it's hard to type. So no problem. Uh, we'll, we just want you to get well, okay? Um, Colin, did you have anything else to say? Because I wasn't quite sure if that was your main point that you brought in or just a side point. I mean, Michael kind of took some of my main points. So yeah, I guess that was my main point. Okay, okay, good. All right, so Ryan, yeah, you can just, I've combed through a lot of articles before I could get, you know, this sort of picture of stuff. Um, but let's do the environmental ethics one and just let's compare it. Do you remember the article about Hinduism said, not only is it possible to link religion with environmental protection, if you really want people to be motivated, because this is what motivates people, then you do need to bring in religion. And there's no reason not to, because it has all these really important values, like they're against greed. And they think, you know, there's higher powers, like in Hinduism, it's karma. So, um, so those habits of mind and those habits of life, thinking there are forces greater than you, and you need to live in sync with them, right? That's very consistent with an environmental ethic. And then, um, so that would Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hindu, Buddha, Confucius, all of those, and all the indigenous cultures that are much closer to the earth in the first place. Um, so that, that basic intuition, right, is something that's compatible. And also, um, you're not going to be able to move forward unless you tap into that. So, you know, separating religion from science, from environmental science, and specifically, is really, really wrong and politically stupid, or socially stupid. But anyway, so the Hindus and Buddhists were just about karma, right? Not creating bad karma. But the Muslims and the Christians, they tend to be the religions of the book. They tend to focus on more legalistic arrangements like a covenant or a legal foundation or Sharia law. Um, but both of them are that, that God is separate from the creation, but God created everything. And it's a real violation of God's intention for us, for us to undermine the creation in consciously undermine it so at this point in history you cannot say i didn't know right this is in your generation if you have older people running society that said that deny it or that say well i didn't know that that's it like you should be very upset you should have known and you should have done something about it now i've got to pick up so anyway um, so we have, and then with Confucius, the great harmony, that's sort of obvious. Anyway, so Islam, the chapter in the book, like the branches, different branches of you uniting religion or, or humanism with environmental protection. If you remember the humanist manifestos, each one, 1933, was more spiritual humanism 1973 brought in started to bring in environmental issues and technology the 2001 was about plenary uh, humanism and that was all about global and so humanists are very much more and more focused on environment because that's the source of all the other problems um, injustices climate migrants 
uh, the gap between the rich and the poor internally and between countries, all of that stuff is going to be incredibly magnified by environmental issues, uh, water shortages, food shortages because of desertification, erosion, um, the aquifer depletion, all sorts of stuff. But anyway, the basic concept are that, that the environment is God create, God's creation. We need to protect it and value it, right? It's a value. It's not all just calculating my own survival. It's, it's God's creation, right? That's, you shouldn't have to just use rational arguments. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so the, all the living species, all the animals and plants, and, and the minerals and rocks, they all are in praise of the creation, right? They all glorify God. Um, and the laws, right? The way nature works was made by God. Um, humans are not the only community. Um, so we were created in the image of God. So on these religions of the book, yes, we're higher than the other creatures, but that gives us a responsibility to treat them, deliberately treat them well, and that gives, and we're going to roast in hell if we don't, right? Whereas um, a monkey is not going to get roast in hell if the monkey ends up, um, I don't know, doing something nasty to another monkey, right? It's only humans that have this capacity for good and evil, and they have to choose if they're going to respect the environment or not. But there, it's no, you can't say oh, I thought God wanted me to do this and the end times were at hand. And um, I think you're just telling God, you know, you're putting God on a timeline. You're telling God, oh, I guess it's about time. I guess you wanted to end life on earth because you certainly wouldn't want me not to be able to drive my uh, SUV or have my nice house. That certainly couldn't be true. So you must, this must be the end times. Uh, to me, that's a bit arrogant, like you're putting God on a timetable. <laughs> and, and I think all the religions of the book would say, wait a second, no, no. We're back to the balancing, remember Aristotle and balancing. Um, and we're also supposed to look long term. And those are ancient values is that you think about seven generations. You definitely at least think about your grandchildren, two generations. Only humans have this duty. Um, the ethical, okay, it's more than just uh, ethical conscience. There's outside influences. We have to, there's a ethic of how we relate to the, to the natural world. Um, all right. Um, let's see, legal instructions have been revealed to your conscience. Um, Okay, okay, and alien law. Okay, so human beings, human rulers can make laws that are legally binding. You'll get put in jail if you don't follow them, but they're not necessarily morally binding. So that's what um, Martin Luther King said, that the Jim Crow laws were legally binding, but they weren't morally binding. They weren't the divine law or the natural law. Um, okay, truthfulness. Um, all right, Islamic values are eternal. Um, our relationship, this is what Ryan pointed out, right? Enjoy, use, and benefit, but preserve, protect, and promote. Um, okay, we have to intervene to protect the earth, not intervene to destroy it. Um, we have to be sustainable, and it's possible, and that's how we're meant to live. So, so that's that one. And then I did have, um, whoops, I did have an outline of another one, which I just wanted to point out a couple um, points in that outline. Um, because uh, what he said, he quotes a number of things. When I taught at Asia University, my students found a lot of quotes from the Quran. 
and from the Sharia law. But his thing is, um, it was the Westerners that separated science from the sacred and religion from the secular. That was when they started exploiting nature for human well being, but they called it God's will. And then they forced that in their colonization of the rest of the world was really about exploiting natural resources. So they had to legitimize it and they used Christianity to legitimize it, okay? Western Christianity was combined with Western science um, where the Arabs were at the time living more harmoniously. That's what the people in India, the Hindus, the Buddhists, they were all living more harmoniously. And then we came in there. Um, I mean, it wasn't, I, people did have a higher standard of life, li life, but now is the payback, right? It was at the expense and it was definitely the Westerners were getting rich whereas the local people were maybe getting a little better off, but um, all right. Um, okay, Westerners tend to respond to the problems created by science and technology with more science and technology rather than fitting into the cycles. And there's these three types. So um, the Aristotelians are traditionalists. And then there's the moderns, the ones who split nature and culture and use science and technology and call it God's will. And then there's the fundamentalists who just, they agree with the moderns, basically. They don't question modernity, which is kind of odd. Um, let's see, all right. That, that was a point I wanted to make, that you're gonna find, um, the fossil fuel billionaires and the evangelicals are basically on the same page in this for different reasons. One of them is it's the end times and the other one is, well, I wanna keep making money, but they're, they'll agree that you, you can ignore it or um, you can demonize somebody, try to use it to gain votes being anti-environment can get you votes. Okay, now the terrorism. All right, so what I did was I was at this conference. I got invited to a conference about terrorism. And I just told my colleagues, you guys know way more about this than I do. And they said, yeah, but you're from America and we want it to be an international conference. So you have to come. And I was, it was me and a guy from Malaysia and maybe somebody else, but that, you know, they wanted to label it international. And so I needed to give a talk. And I was like, ah, this is about a week before. So I just took Aristotle's old virtues and I thought, okay, how is it? And Aristotle would agree with this, um, that the way the virtues, personal virtue, social virtue, political virtue, affect whether a society is internally stable and can avoid terrorists within the country and then between countries. So um, Aristotle, you know, temperance, self-control in relation to eating, drinking, and sex, and as opposed to greed, right? And he says, greed is the political evil. So if America, I mean, actually, the, the guys that bombed us on 9-11, I, I had heard, I can't remember actually reading this, but makes perfect sense that their plan was just to do it once and watch America fall apart. Let Americans trash each other rather than if we keep having these attacks, they will have a common enemy and they will be strong against us. If we do it once, those arrogant SOB Americans, they're just gonna blame each other and point the finger at each other and actually undermine their society. They're gonna destroy themselves. You don't have to do it for them. And that's, you know, that's the way it's turned out. Like right after 9-11, there was a period of unity and I did have you reading stuff and then it ended. And it was us versus them. And we went and intimidated the Europeans. You have to be on our side. 
Europe did not want to invade Iraq. The only country that went along with us in Europe was England. And Tony Blair had a huge, his, his popularity went from like 65% to 25%. He completely lost his career because he sided with us. Um, anyway, I mean, I don't know. I, I do wish you'd know some of that history because it really did affect your life. Even though it came right before you were born, it really did make a difference. Like we could be in you know, a different world if we'd made different choices right then. Um, anyway, within the country, greed creates this rich and poor and social instability and it nurtures terrorism. We have that right now, right? We have a lot of terrorism and it's not Muslim terrorism, <laughs> it's white supremacists. These groups are classified. Some of them are classified as hate groups, but some of them are classified as terrorists. Then they should be because of the damage that is being done. Um, and that's just due to greed, that that makes us internally very unstable. And it also aggravates. Um, it's amazing to me there aren't more Muslim Americans that are more violent than they are, because really, they're not. I mean, it's almost all white folk. Um, all right, so then courage, how do we react, right? After 9-11, how do we react? Did we overreact or underreact? Well, we overreacted, but we could have prevented the problem, right? And um, there are politicians who benefit from us being greedy and not preventing it because then they can use an event like that or the threat of terrorism to gain power. So the military can take over, uh, the rich can take over, um, and they can keep the, the public focused on these terrorists. And in the meanwhile, they're creating all these laws to favor the rich. Um, so that's what Bush did. Um, okay, the political courage, not too much, not too little fear, it's difficult. And a good politician will try to educate the public about what should we fear and what shouldn't we fear. And they will coordinate the military, the intelligence and diplomacy. Um, because one reason we invaded Iraq was that we had false intelligence. We th uh, there was a claim that they had weapons of mass destruction and they did not. And there were people who said that and knew that it was false. And they're, because they just wanted us to go in there and get cheap oil. So that was greed driven that war. And that's caused a lot more terrorism in the world. And it's made us a lot more vulnerable to terrorism. Um, okay, anger, don't be too angry. Don't take revenge. Right after 9-11, everyone's crying. All these innocent people are dying. It's so awful. And then someone took a survey. Um, do you think, um, do you want to uh, bomb Saddam, uh, even though it would cause uh, innocent people to die? And 71% of Americans said, yeah, revenge, that's what I want. So of course, the politicians went ahead and did it. And um, there are more terrorists in Iraq now, way, way more than there were. Saddam did not allow uh, Osama bin Laden or um, into the country because they were religiously based and he was a secular guy. So he had protected Iran from, um, golly, I can't remember the organization that actually bombed us, the name of- Al-Qaeda. Yes, okay. So Saddam, did. there were no Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and now there's tons of them. Plus, um, there were plenty of Mideast specialists who told the Bush administration, if we go in there, Al-Qaeda is going to come in and take over, and there's going to be ISIS. There's going to be, I mean, it was all very predictable, and we just don't get it in the news anymore, but it's a mess. And um, I mean, Americans just don't hear about it because it makes people look bad. And it is terrible how we don't know the history. 
you know, even the history of the last 20, 30, 40 years, we, we don't know nothing. And then we claim to know this stuff about the founding fathers. It's absolute lie. Oh my gosh, you guys. <laughs> Every year I think, oh my goodness, these students didn't even have a chance to know this. Um, all right, so we started this war on terror. Well, what the heck is that, you know? Um, and then uh, international leaders. What happened was after 9-11 and after the Bush folk, you know, used it to help the rich get richer and help the power hungry get more powerful and using God, all these people in these other countries imitated us. So they learned from us how to destroy democracy. They used to be trying to learn from us how to create democracy. And I'm not exaggerating. I sure wish I, I were, but now we have a huge rise in authoritarianism. And if you look at how they're doing it, they're doing it in the name of democracy and protecting their people from democracy. I had a girl from Syria and she said, I mean, those are, in our view, the Syrian leaders use gas, you know, they use biological weapon on their own people. I mean, they're like the pits. But she said the propaganda is that their political enemies are terrorists and they're going to ruin you and they're going to take over and they hate democracy and we're the ones that are trying to preserve your well-being and we have to have this control just to protect you from those awful people and it's not an abuse of uh, power and it's just this is as much power as we need just to eventually get back to democracy i mean <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's amazing. And you're never going to get this in the news. Like you have to have students from there before you really know what's going on. Um, so another way to sort of tamp down extremism is try to set up economic programs, provide citizens with opportunities so they have a stake in the society and they aren't going to try to tear it apart. Um, Okay, I think that's also why we should have a national endowment for the arts and the humanities is that you should give kids in poor areas of the country, rural and urban, you know, have money so they can take a bus and go to the theater and go to the museums and go to a play and have people, artists come into their classrooms just so they get a sense of the society cares about you. And if you get a job and you become a citizen, you can go to the theater, you can go to the museums, you can go to, you know, all this stuff. Cause you're, you know, you've got to let people in. You've got to give people a stake. And then they're a lot less likely, likely to be violent because they have something to lose. But if you if people have nothing to lose and they have no hope, then they become violent. And this is true for for white people that feel really afraid of being able to survive. It's true of anybody, but we also need to have that same kind of attitude about how to avoid more terrorism, how to you know, convince people that they'll have a better life if they don't just start shooting people up. Uh, rational humor. Um, Okay, so figuring out, there's some comedian that's a ventriloquist that has this little puppet that's a terrorist. Have you guys ever heard of this? Jeff what Dunham? is it again? There's a, there's a comedian who's a ventriloquist and he has this little puppet. Are you talking about Jeff Dunham? Maybe, right? It's a terrorist and it kind of makes fun of. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that's probably good for you because it, you know, okay, I got to take time off to stop obsessing about how awful terrorists are, right? I got to laugh a little bit about this because, you know, not everybody around the corner is a terrorist and not every woman wearing a hijab is a terrorist, right? I got to get over that. Um, okay, try to, you've got to, help people distinguish between good and bad rulers and learning who to trust and who not to trust. It's important. Um, okay, expose the use of terrorists to justify takeover, takeovers. You have to develop critical thinking, right? Keeping the issue in perspective. 
being sociable, getting along with people. Um, that's where the one girl's grandma just has, since 9-11, she developed phobias, like she doesn't trust anybody and she carries a gun. <laughs> and I mean, she's going to have a quick trigger finger. Um, and then a woman in a burka comes by. Oh, I'm sure she has a gun. I mean, that's, to me, that's doesn't make me feel more secure that that grandma is going to, you know, shoot to kill anybody she thinks is a terrorist. I don't know why people think they're more safe that way. Um, okay, avoid responding to irrational prejudice. Rational ambition, make good decisions, manage your career. In other words, each of you has to find something to have a stable life, a flourishing life. And that, you know, the more people that flourish, the more your society is woven together and it's stable and people trust each other and they develop friendship bonds, the less likely you are to get have people that just want to blow the system up. Um, if power depends upon family, you have richer and richer people that are more and more indifferent, then you're going to get people that are angry and have nothing to lose. You should honor people who are weaving the society together. Um, you should honor security forces, police and military when they're behaving themselves, but also the people who prevent the problems, intelligence, diplomacy, and economic development. Like we should all be working together. Um, and don't let ambitious politicians use terrorism to create this us versus them. Um, rational rhetoric, that's very important, right? You got to find uh, news that's not manipulative and that isn't just have an agenda. I mean, that's really hard and it's hard to figure out what's worth reporting. And I, you know, I just think about how I've let myself get too focused on certain issues and not enough on other issues. There's so much going on in the world, um, but try to check your mind all the time. Um, all right, so use terrorism, okay. And then you can use that. You could say, okay, um, I don't know if terrorism is a major issue for you or whatever is, but whatever it is that you think is the most polarizing issue. And it was when I wrote this in 20, what, 17? Um, whatever you think is a really polarizing issue, just take that issue and think about how is it that this issue is causing all this poison in the community, political community, and say, okay, how do I deal with that one? And then that's your model for what other issues are there or could there be? And I have to dismantle this, right? Just, I mean, when I was growing up, it was communism. That was the, the bad guy was the communists, the reds, they're gonna come get us, you know? <laughs> and so when the terrorists appeared, like I knew right away, like that's what I grew up with. Um, so you'll have to think about, I don't know, is it the libs, you know, or is it the Trumps, Trumpists or whatever? I don't know, it's up to you. But whenever you have this black and white us versus them, it's not true and it's polluting your mind, right? Which is your most valuable asset. Don't let anybody pollute your mind. Don't eat junk food for your mind, which is probably social media is junk food for your mind. Um, okay, so how to create laws that make sense. Um, same punishment for the same crime. Dis distribute social goods. Continue the flow of information. Um, how do you punish without over punishing? And that was the military tribunals. Guantanamo Bay was terrible. Um, I read a whole book on that. The dark side it was 350 pages about our torture programs. Terrible. Um, okay, terrorism is a problem because they're not soldiers with outfits on that represent a country. So we have to figure that out. I think another main source of war at this point is cyber, uh, cyber war. 
So the Russians are very engaged in cyber war and they've been very successful. Um, they put their best and brightest to work in cyber wars. They've always put their best and brightest to work on military issues. And, the, and, and it was science and technology that they always got their best and brightest and the state paid for it. They used to live in, during the Cold War, they all lived in a whole compound. They had a whole village, high-class life, and then they kept working on bombs and military stuff. So now the Russians have cyber, uh, cyber war, really good at it. Um, okay, so judges in terrorist cat, uh, cases ought to use the same criteria as any other kind of case. And we're notorious for, um, we were, have been notorious for arresting people as terrorists without adequate information. And then they didn't get a chance to defend themselves and they got tortured in prison before they even had a lawyer. Or, I mean, it, we violated all of our own Western ideals of the rule of law and the right to uh, legal defense and the right to a fair trial and the right, you know. Anyway, we made all those mistakes. How should we employ our intellectual virtues? That's the cyber war thing. Um, and how else can we apply them? Can we apply them to preventing animosity and lack of trust? And then there's the object of wish, um, how to persuade the public, the union of faith and reason. Um, I talked about that a little bit. And then the last part of this. So uh, again, you know, Ryan was talking about the union of faith and reason and environmental issues, but the union of faith and reason and terrorist issue also, um, because what, because you really want to think God wants us to get along, right? We're all creatures. We're all made in the image of God, or we're all part of this universe. So whether you think God is the Atman Brahman, or you think God is this creator God, ultimately, we're supposed to be getting along. And so if that's true, then when people use religion to create all this animosity, that is the antithesis of what God wants based on the union of faith and reason. So I think it's in, as intuitively obvious that using religion as a weapon, especially in this war on terror, is as offensive to any sort of God as it is to, to destroy the creation knowing that you're destroying it, right? I think those are equally offensive in the eyes of any kind of personal God and also any kind of karma type God, any sort of harmony. Um, and that's up to you to decide what you think, but at least I have an argument. This paper has an argument for um, that, that you can't get away with using God for mm -hmm. demonizing and terrorizing. Um, Okay, in the free will, righteousness, all those are, you know, standard arguments. And then this was a talk I gave in Indonesia. So I use, I referred back to their political ideology. When the US, you would refer back to the Declaration of Independence, right? Um, everybody's created free and equal. And then I would go from there, but it's the same process. Uh, you have to go back to the five pillars the five principles of Panchasila. And then I also showed how they fit with the five pillars of Islam, just like you can do our founding fathers, and then you can show how that also fits in with biblical commands, you know, with what Jesus wanted or what God wants. Um, you should never use it as a weapon. Um, anyway, that's and I, I speak as a philosopher. This is the discipline of philosophy, right? No philosopher is going to think an ideology is more important than reality. <laughs> um, all right, so fatalism. Well, okay, let me go back to terrorism, give everybody uh, their um, reaction. You got to say something. What, did, what struck you about um, the idea of thinking about how our country can be safer against terrorism or more vulnerable uh, to terrorism based on Aristotle's virtues, right? 
Does somebody want to start? Oh, good, Tim, go ahead. Okay, so what I was saying earlier, I put it in my, uh, I put it in the chat as well. Oh, okay. It says, uh, do not reward terrorist attacks by giving potential terrorists more social advantages than others. Okay. So like, like social media, stuff like that. Like more outlets and tools on the uh, on your phones to learn like more stuff. Like I'm not explaining. Like there's a lot of technology now that you can do a lot of stuff with. It's just normal people don't really think about it. Terrorists trying to think about it because they want to answer. So yeah. for sure, technology is kind of rewarding them because I'm not saying just automatically think if you have a job on your terrorist, but just keep your eyes open on anything suspicious, no matter what they were. Okay. Um, Michael left to celebrate his birthday. I think we should let him do that. I'm not that much of a, <laughs> a meanie, right? He's going to leave the last hour for his birthday party. Um, yeah, Tim, that sounds good. Um, again, you'll have to put that in your post. And I could understand it a lot better. Um, uh, Zane, what about you? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Tim said. Um, kind of like the, uh, I don't know, like the exact virtues, but like the, um, I can't think of any that comes to mind, but obviously, like kind of giving them more of a platform obviously would be a terrible thing that we do. And um, I don't know the exact virtue, but there's one, I forgot what it said, but I kind of lost my train of thought. But I, there was one that I said that kind of fit really well or uh with this and I, it made us more vulnerable but i can't remember the exact one i'm sorry well, there's greed it, there's greed right yeah exactly yeah there's greed that obviously uh that's that wouldn't be a good one no <laughs> that obviously makes more vulnerable but there was another one but i forgot what it was okay revenge anger um oh uh, yeah uh, yeah i think it was yeah it was revenge because yeah seeking out revenge it's kind of like ties into the other things obviously that doesn't call, that doesn't help much you know First of all, just seeking out revenge. Um, but I think that can also make you more vulnerable because I think that can, in a, in a, like, whenever you're just going out and seeking revenge, I think that uh, kind of exposes you in a lot of ways. You know, it leaves you, you know, with weak spots, if that makes sense. Well, actually, I do want you, if you can remember this, there aren't a lot of things I want you to remember, but this. After 9 11, the People who wanted to go into Iraq for cheap oil, but they didn't want to say that. Um, they said that the war will pay for itself in six months because we'll get cheap oil and we'll pay for all the cost of the war. That's what they sold the American public on. Do you think you would have been a sucker and believe that? You would think about this because these things are going to happen again and again. Did the war pay for itself? Yeah, I think that's that's an issue because whenever people say stuff like that, um, especially like I mean, they, they can make it. I mean, I know, I, like talking about like whenever you like falling for. I mean, I, it'd be easy for people like when they talk about this stuff. I mean, it seems like they're making sense and like, oh yeah, that's that that'd be great. But obviously, you know. That's not always the case, but I mean, I can see where the Mid East yeah. specialists were saying no, but it was advertising, right? It was doing fo focus groups and finding out what people wanted to hear, what they would put up with. Really, focus groups are just about how do you get the vote and they figure out what to say. That has nothing to do with what's true. So you have to be really careful. Do you know how much that war has cost us so far? I have no idea, but I know it's a lot. Over a trillion bucks. That was a war that was going to pay for itself in six months. And, you know, you guys should be upset. You're inheriting all this garbage, all this debt. And, you know, I, again, I don't want to, you have enough to worry about, but please just learn the lesson. Don't be a sucker. Okay, because you don't want to make those kind of mistakes for your kids. Does that make sense, Zane? Yes, ma'am. What do you want to tell your kids about, you know, what happened, what you thought, what you did, whether you did the right thing or the wrong thing? 
I mean, this is not, this is not easy. Um, all right, so Colin, what about you in terms of uh, the virtues and terrorism? Um, I was just kind of listening in on the whole going to war and making back the money and things like that. I thought that was kind of interesting, but yeah, what? it's there, there was a project for the new American century and their goal was to create an economic empire and they wanted to go in there. But they couldn't do it politically because Americans didn't want it. And then there was 9-11. They also were warned about terrorist attacks and they didn't pay attention. And then it happened a day later. Oh, let's use this as an excuse to go get Saddam and over a trillion dollars later. So I can send you that information if you want. I wouldn't be saying this if I didn't have it documented. But mostly, I just want you to try to learn from history, right? Try to be critical thinkers. Try not to get sucked up um, because it's really easy. And I know you see other people that do get sucked up by social media, right? But it is really complicated. It's very, it's much easier to see somebody else making a mistake than it is to figure out like, well, what is best and what news should I watch? How do I find out what's really going on? Um, all right, Jordan, you're, yeah, you can't talk. And Tim, is everybody clocked in? Anybody else want to say anything? So the idea is uh, greed, temperance, courage, generosity, trying to prevent it with economic programs, uh, trying to prevent it with the coordinating diplomacy, intelligence, military, trying to do preventive things. Um, ambition, trying to, you know, work hard and maybe want to be one of those diplomats or want to be one of those FBI or, you know, with a sense of mission and also military, but it's with a sense of mission, a sense that I'm, I'm not going to just blindly believe that whatever wars were sent to are, you know, absolutely necessary and exactly what the spiel is. I'm going to go in there as a thoughtful military person, which is fine. A lot of them in there are very thoughtful, as a matter of fact. I've listened to interviews with a lot of them. Um, and then uh, rational honor. Who do you honor, right? Do you honor the critical thinkers or the blind believers? That makes a lot of difference in the culture that you're creating. Uh, friendships. Do you listen to a lot of different people, get a lot of perspectives? try to come up with the best one. Um, Self-knowledge, make sure you don't project all your insecurities onto somebody else <laughs> or your fears. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. It's all interconnected. Um, all right. So the next thing was fatalism. Okay. So I'm going to ask each of you, do you think religion is good because it makes people resilient? because they say, well, it must be God's will because God's in charge and that sort of calms you down and gets you up in the morning. Um, and, and this was in Indonesia. So it was interesting because I heard the talk in Indonesia and they had that experience of the tsunami, that absolutely huge uh, wave that took out so many people. And also there's a lot of volcanoes right in cities. The city that I'm going to in a month and a half had a volcano that the lava just right in the, right in the city. Um, so they have their natural disasters and then they, some of them think it's God's will and God is testing us. Um, and to what extent is it good? Because it makes resilience. People can withstand the loss, how they react. It's a test of my faith. Um, but um, so, so then how does it, um, how does it make things worse? Because it doesn't get people to, we could have prevented this, right? Why didn't we prevent? Why didn't we at least try to prevent terrorist attacks? Why do we keep treating the people in the Mideast like crap? 
Why do we know that they're mad at us and they're going to do something to us? Why don't we know this? Why don't we prevent it? Why don't we protect ourselves from it? Um, if it's just God's will or if it's a holy war, then, you know, that's the meaning of it. You don't have to do anything to try and get along with these people. Try to treat them fairly. Um, and how do you recover from us? Um, so is the cause God's will or is it human arrogance and ignorance? Um, in terms of the, um, the tsunami, there were some articles that came out and I, I don't know, I can attach it if you want. There were four different responses. And one of them said, um, one of them was, where was God? You know, how come God let this happen? And well, we have to just trust God, whatever. Another one said, we had all the technology, so we could have had this in place. It would have predicted the earthquake. Well, it would have alerted us to the earthquake, and we could have evacuated everybody before the wave hit. But Americans were too cheap. If they'd paid 25 cents per person more, all that technology would be in place. So his thing was, this is a secular issue, right? That would be a humanist. This is about using our knowledge, our science and technology to prevent problems. And it's greed that prevents it. It's blind faith. It's politicians that use blind faith. That's the problem, right? So that's a humanist versus a fundamentalist. But again, there's a middle ground there. Um, God would want us to spend money to get this stuff in place to protect ourselves. That would be the union of reason and faith. Um, okay, so the purely secular response is, is that every disaster could be prevented and you have to find someone to blame or you have to blame religion or something. Um, so I would say sometimes it's just accident, but the tsunami was not. And most volcanoes, are not like, but some are, some of them, they're not predictable and they're very arbitrary and there's no warning. Others, there was one in Oregon where the, you know, the mountain was sort of coughing up smoke and, you know, people were saying, get out of there, get out of there. And some people still didn't get out of there. Well, that's not God's fault. <laughs> um, and then, um, Hurricane Katrina, I don't, again, I was living in Arkansas when that happened, and I would overhear people saying stuff, and one person was talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, like uh, New Orleans is the big easy, you know, there's all this sex and drugs and jazz and music, it's very self-indulgent, God is just punishing New Orleans, but there's another one that says, Actually, that hurricane almost took down all these oil wells. So God is telling us, would you cut with the fossil fuels, right? It's making all the hurricanes worse, um, you know? And then so a secular person would say, look, what do you expect? The climate scientists have told us, us this for 70 years. They, they have these models that say this is all the hurricanes are going to get worse. All the floods are going to get worse. All the droughts are going to get worse. This is it, guys. We've been trying to tell you, and you bring in their, your stupid religion and deny it, or you bring in your political rhetoric and your wicked power driven politicians, and you totally deny it. Um, so, looking forward, what are you guys going to do? There's going to be climate change issues, there are going to be wars. Some people are going to recommend a religious revival, you know, make sure you're saved before all hell breaks loose. Um, or are you going to think science can control everything and just despise religion? Or how should you interpret it? How will politicians take advantage of it? You, can, you need to anticipate this so that when it happens, you can go, oh, I get that. We studied that. Or when we studied it, it registered, and here's an example, right? Um, how do we develop hope without being deluded, right? How do you have a positive worldview uh, in the face of the facts, 
right? And not run away, have an escapist worldview and not get obsessed or get depressed or whatever. So how do you set all that stuff up? Um, and that, you know, your final papers could be about something like that if you want. Okay, so I wanna ask each of you, do you think religion is more like resilience or more like fatalism? Uh, or, and how, what do you think it ought to be? Like, how do you envision that? Um, in dealing with these climate change disasters or any sort of natural disasters, right? What do you think, Ryan? Well, for me personally, I am somebody who takes accountability for my, like, for what I do. Like, I have faith that everything will work out in the end, but that doesn't mean I stop pursuing what I'm doing because I think God is going to handle it. Like, I don't think it's just going to be given. And I think like God has a plan for us, but it's up to us to get through to get to that plan. And so I feel like there is people who definitely take advantage of the idea that like, oh, God's going to take care of it. Or um, I don't need to do this because if God can handle anything, he's not going to let the world crash, right? Like he's not going to let that happen. But that's again, manipulating um, the teachings, you know, like God believed in hard work. He believed in, you know, persevering and all of this stuff, like, you know, but also have faith. Like you can't, you can't take, 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 but never give. Like you, you can't take the blessings that God gives, but not try and get to know him, not try and, you know, live your life to glorify him or to live your life to have a better place for other people. So I feel like it's got to be a balance, but I personally, that's how I, I view it. Like I take accountability, but I also have faith. Well, it would be, I'm going to live the most sustainably way I can, but um, not blame God if, you know, if things don't work, if other, you know, it's not God's fault if sustainability keeps getting worse, but I'll do my share. Does that make sense? I mean, we're all in it together. Like there's things that collectively happen that aren't an individual's responsibility, but you are responsible for doing what you can and making sure other people don't excuse it or blame God for it. Does that make sense? I think that's what you're saying. A quote um, that I turned in my last reflection on, something that I thought was really like candy was like, I think this was from Gandhi. It was like, change what you can change and accept what you can't. Like you change, like you have to like change what you see, like that's around you, like change your lifestyle, like change the things you can change. Like ultimately you can't tell somebody don't litter, you know what I'm saying? But you can prevent the things that like, you can really fix what you can fix. And I think like that goes back to like, this was like the first or second week we had class. We talked, I think Jordan was talking about it. Like it's a system issue. It's a system that like it's the big corporations, you know what I'm saying? Like me using my, my reusable bag at Walmart, one, like, you know, the two times I go is not going to be as big of an impact than, you know, fossil fuels and stuff like that. Like people limiting that or the garbage patch, like limiting the amount of garbage that's going into the, um, you know, going to the ocean or even um, defin like people who's in Japan that was doing the shark fins, like, you know, all of those things, like those are big scale problems that again we're gonna need everybody to kind of unite with but at the moment like you like me ryan hioki is not gonna like change the finning industry you know but i can do what i can do to try and help the earth as best i can but that again that's all i can do right you keep it in mind you don't push it out of your mind just because yeah yeah okay like the truth is not a function of what you have control over <laughs> right? It's true, even if I can't control it. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So, Tim, what have you got? So, um, okay, so the question is, is, is I would say, um, well, I wouldn't let science just determine and stuff like that, but I would heavily make sure it's a part of the 
like, I don't know how to really answer that question that well, but I just wouldn't be, I would be more comfortable in believing in science, but having a backbone for how the other stuff could be without it, just by what you believe, just in case all fails in science. Okay, okay. What about you, Colin? Uh, I think it's hard to describe it because I think that religion and science both go hand in hand more than people believe without religion, in my opinion, gives an us like an unjust like belief in why things are happening. They're just black and white god said so god didn't say so science kind of breaks it down a little more and gives like more into it but when a catastrophe happens and things of that nature religion's gonna pull a society back together before science will unless it's i'm saying like natural not including like viruses and things of that nature I th well, like with 9-11, it pulled people together for about two months, and then it divided people, right? Yeah, I think it. no one's going to be together forever. Like, no one, no two people are going to agree on everything for a long time. I think the short span of time of two months, granted, 9-11 was a little bit different, but if they put if something big like that happens again and there's someone in charge who can direct anyone to like a neutral ground approach of everything i think those two months will expand into maybe a year and who knows what could happen within a year with america with 300 million people working together right so so we've already in your lifetime just about had 9-11 and economic collapse and COVID. And now we're having climate disasters, right? So really thinking about how do we use these things to weave ourselves together instead of blow ourselves apart? Because so far, the overall effect has been worse polarization, right? So I do think your generation doesn't like polarization and knows it's not going anywhere. It, and so you have to figure out how to turn it around. Does that make sense, Colin? Yeah, but one thing I would also have to say is, yes, we don't like polarization as a group, but we also have all these cultures within society right now that if you don't believe their way, like, it just it's still polarizing but they don't want to say that they're polarizing and it's happening from every aspect that you can look at it's just um, that college sophomores are old enough to see through all that right sometimes but well, it's yeah it's, they're old enough to be responsible for seeing through it does that make sense yes they it have the ability to do, but they they have the intellectual facility to do it I agree with that one. That's why they're called sophomore. In Greek, it means wise fool, because they can see through all the crap, but they haven't yet kind of invested in anything, which tends to make people blind. Uh, but it's a good moment. You know, it's a good moment for critical thinking. Um, so I've watched students, right? They're critical. Then they decide to become a pre-med major. Well, you know, the medical profession, they're not all bad. <laughs> like whoever said they were. It's just that all of a sudden you have a stake in something and all of a sudden, you know, the blinders go on. Or if you've oversimplified, right? Then all of a sudden you realize, well, that's more complex. Well, everything is more complex than when you're in this sophomoric mood. <laughs> But the sophomoric mood makes you aware that it's possible to critically think about everything in, in their substance in saying all is vanity, you know, adults are all corrupt. There's, you know, there's some substance in it, but then you have to weave out, tease out the complexity. Um, Zane, what do you think? Do you think religion is res promotes resilience, helps people get stronger, or 
fatalism. It just, people just don't work on preventing things. Um, I think in its true form, what it's meant to be is resilient. Kind of like what you said, like the first two months after 9-11, it brought people together. I think that's what it's supposed to be like, I mean, in the right way. But obviously, I think it's easy. Or most of the religions, it's easy to misinterpret and also kind of twist. So that leads to fatalism and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, and also like going with science, we've said earlier that um, science and religion, I don't, it, like, I don't believe it's supposed to contradict each other or go against each other. I think whenever one contradicts the other, that's whenever your manipulation and stuff like that happens. But I think it, in its true form and how it should be is if it, like science and religion, you know, they work together. And I believe that's like where it would be beneficial and bring people together. But yeah, that's what I think about it. Okay. Tim, what about you? Are you there? Okay, so I'm going to talk about tomorrow, what your assignment for tomorrow is. Um, okay, so what have we got? I am going to show you some slides of Indonesia, talk about um, democracy in Indonesia a little bit. And I would like you to read, um, oh, read these tsunami editorials. There are, there's four different reactions to the tsunami. And you, you have to bring which one or ones you liked and um, why. And then um, these are really interesting articles. They're just from the newspaper in Jakarta. And I wish you'd read just a couple of pages, you know, one or two of those editorials. Um, this one, holistic education. Uh, okay, I guess that one, the first one would be good to read there. It's about Islam and holistic education. And that's moral education and intellectual, which is what Aristotle wanted. And this is interesting because um, people from Indonesia were applying to public policy programs in the US. And it is amazing because the US has a reputation for having all these programs about public policy and innovative governance and all this great stuff. But then Americans themselves have no education in public policy or good governance. You know, they're notoriously ignorant about public policy. I hate that government, I hate that government. Well, if you say that, you're going to get the very worst political leaders because you're not distinguishing between good public policy and bad public policy. And I know that I ask, I tend to ask my freshmen, what is public policy? And they don't even know, like they haven't even heard the two words together. And that's the whole difference between democracy and authoritarianism is that we have the rule of law. So we have policies that were passed by legal experts or experts in uh, department. And we don't, you know, and we even have all sorts of educational graduate schools in it. And Americans are the, you know, as bad as anybody at knowing anything about it. It's very, I find it annoying. Um, and then this one, uh, you don't have to read the 11. I'll just cut that one out. Well, I'll leave it in. It's about a mathematician who's an atheist. And you can read that if you want. But the other two are about um, physics and quantum physics united with some belief in God. And I, I hope you can read that. Let's see. Um, is this just the outline? This is just a bunch of quotes. So I guess I didn't have you reading the actual article. But if you read those quotes, three pages of quotes, and then this one, oh yeah, more three. Okay, so it's six pages of quotes. So go, please read that. And then um, there's, a, there's a little PowerPoint on, I'll give you the PowerPoint. And then this is another outline about um, the intersection of politics, economics, and religion. And uh, just look over that. So we'll look over that. And then uh, Friday, you just start writing your outline of your final worldview. 
And you definitely have to have something about how did it change? What is there something I really believe that I don't believe anymore? At least one thing. But most of it is just, I had never thought of that before. So you're adding, or what I thought about that, I added a lot more, right? You're expanding your worldview, um, or you're adding something from nothing, or you're actually taking something away from where you were before. Um, you can look back at your first assignment, and you could probably realize that you didn't write in that assignment nearly exactly what you realize now that you'd had in the back of your mind. So you can add to it, but you know, you do want to look back at that one and say, how has it changed the most, right? What would be the biggest change in my worldview? It might just be the fact that now I know I have one, <laughs> you know, now I know there was something in my head that when things would come my way, an event or a reading, it would bounce off my presuppositions. Um, so now I know that they're there and I have to keep re-examining them that I didn't know that before. Okay, it's 8.29. I think I made it under the wire. Um, so I'll see you tomorrow and we'll talk about all that stuff. All right, and I'll wait if somebody wants to talk after class. Okay, have a good night. Dr. Beck. Yeah. I have a couple questions. Okay. Um so Friday is wait, do you want to end the recording before I start talking? Oh yes, I yeah. always do. Actually, one time I forgot and I oh that was awful because I had to try to ask the um people 